We are continuing our God is series. Uh, when you think of God, what's the first word that comes to mind? And there are a lot of things that we could say about God. God is holy, or God is powerful, or God is eternal, God is perfect, God is righteous. In this series, we are focusing on the attributes of God that capture how God relates to us and how we find comfort in Him. And one of our directives here at TFRC is safe haven, a place for the lost and broken to find peace and healing through Christ and community. God comes to bring us peace and healing, and that's not something he does out of obligation. God brings peace and healing because that's who God is. In this series, we've looked at how God is love, and how God is good, and how God is missional, and this morning, we will look at how God is active. The passage for this morning is Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 to 11. Um, you can go ahead and look that up in your Bibles. Isaiah is about two-thirds of the way through the Old Testament. Um, you can also look it up on your phones. But God is active, which means that God didn't just create the world. He is actively interested in what happens in it. Our scripture reader for this morning is Marie Cunningham. Marie, please make your way up to the podium. As she does, I'm going to ask if you're able to please stand and face the center of the room. Uh, we read from the center of the room because for us, scripture is central to our faith. It's the primary lens for our faith. And we stand because we believe that this is the word of God. And so, Marie, whenever you're ready, please read from Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 11. Remember, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Marie, thank you very much. You may be seated. When my kids were younger in elementary school, I was more active in their education. Uh, my day off was typically during the week. So on my day off, I could volunteer in my kids' classrooms. Uh, mostly helped by reading with students, and I would spend one hour in each of my kids' classrooms each week. And I did that um, until my kids were done with the fifth grade. Uh, it was fun getting to know the students and the teachers, um, and now all of my kids have graduated from high school but over the years, you know, kind of every now and then, you know, I'll be out at a store or maybe at a restaurant or just somewhere out in public, and someone the age of one of my kids will come up to me and they'll ask me, hey, are you Robert's dad or are you Leanne's dad or are you Peyton's dad? And I'll say yes. And then they will say, hey, you used to come to my school and read with us. And then that will lead to a short or long conversation, and those are, for me, really cool moments. Now, when my kids were in middle and high school, I was more hands-off with their education. I was interested in their grades. I had an expectation for what grades my kids should get. But I didn't regularly check to make sure that they were doing their homework. I didn't make sure that, hey, if they had a test, make sure you're studying for it. I really was more hands-off when it came to that kind of stuff. They knew that if their quarterly grades didn't meet expectations, there would be consequences. So for me, they just had to get the quarterly grades. And how, how prompt they were with their homework or studying for tests, I didn't pay attention to that. Show me the grades. That's what I want to know. So there have been times in my life when I was more active in my kids' education than others. When it comes to God's activity in the world, there are lots of beliefs about it. There's a variety of beliefs about God's activity in the world. One belief is called deism. Deism is the belief that God created the world, but he's not active in the world. 
So God created the world and the universe, but once he set it into motion, he really hasn't been interested in being active in it. Maybe like me with my kids, he checks in quarterly or something like that. But he's not that active, according to someone who's a deist. Well, the Bible has a different view of God. In the Bible, God is very interested in being active in the world he created. He very much cares what is happening. Whether it's stories like the flood or the exodus or crossing the Jordan, God is always intervening. And the epitome of this in Scripture is God the Son becoming human in the person of Jesus and dying on the cross and rising from the dead. God is active. God is active in his presence, his knowledge, his power. God is present to what is happening. God is fully aware of what is happening in the world. God is fully aware of what is happening in your world. And we often express this belief by saying something like, well, God is everywhere. That God's presence is found anywhere we go. The book of Acts puts it this way, Acts chapter 17. God did this so that they would seek him out and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. We live and move and have our being in God's presence. God is present to everything that is happening. Going back to the passage, verse 9, where it says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. The former things, those of long ago. Most likely there, God is referencing the Exodus, when God delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt. Now, a key moment, for those of you familiar with that story, a key moment in that story is the story of the burning bush, where Moses is tending flocks in the desert, and he comes across this burning bush in the desert. And he notices that even though the bush is burning, the fire is not consuming it. And so he stops and just is kind of checking out this strange sight of a bush on fire, but yet the bush isn't being consumed by the fire. And then God speaks to Moses from the bush, and he says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land. God was present to the Israelites' suffering. He saw, he heard, and he was concerned, and so he came and did something about it. He was present to their suffering, and he was going to do something about it. Now, a word about God's timing. When I see suffering and I can do something about it, I want to act quickly. Well, God doesn't act quickly in the same way that we do. God's timing is different from ours. For example, in the Exodus story, many of you know that the suffering of the Israelites began when the Egyptians would take Israelite children, babies, and throw them into the Nile River. Well, from the time that the Egyptians started throwing babies into the Nile River to the time that God appears to Moses in the burning bush and says, I'm going to do something about that, that time between those two events is 80 years. For 80 years, God is present to the Israelites' suffering. Now, if I had God's power, I would have acted much quicker but we don't understand God's timing. God isn't slow to act, at least not in the way we understand slowness. But just because God doesn't act according to our timelines doesn't mean God isn't present. 
It doesn't mean that God isn't active in our lives. God's activity in our lives can take years. Now, some of you know this story that I'm about to tell. In 1996, I was living in California, and I was applying to churches all across the country looking for a job as a youth minister. And I applied to one church that I was really excited about. Uh, it seemed like a church with great ministry mindset. They seemed to have had great momentum. It was a growing church. There was great leadership. There was a fun staff. And so I applied. And in this church's hiring process, I actually made it to be one of the final two candidates. It was me and one other guy. And they brought both of us in for weekend interviews. And so I came in the first weekend. The other guy came in the next weekend. And the first weekend when I came for my interview, I nailed my interview weekend. Okay? I'm not going to be humble about it. I thought I did a great job. I did really good. And I believed that I was going to get that youth ministry position at least offered to me. And I was really excited about that. Um, to, to get that particular youth ministry job because I wanted to be a part of that church staff. I wanted to be a part of that church. Except they went with the other guy. They went with the other guy. And I was pretty devastated and I didn't understand what God was up to because I nailed that interview weekend. Well, I ended up doing youth ministry in Wisconsin. I got a youth ministry position in Wisconsin, which was an amazing place to be in and of itself. That church had a great staff. I learned a lot about ministry, saw some really good ministry fruit. I, I was able to finish um, my education, my master's of divinity degree, which prepared me for the next phase of ministry. And again, as I look back in uh, 1996 and ending up in Wisconsin, I saw how God brought me to the right church at the right time. And then after seven years in Wisconsin, I ended up here at TFRC in 2003. And I've been here for 20 years as an associate pastor, executive pastor, lead pastor. And that time in Wisconsin really prepared me for all the roles that I've had here at TFRC, at this church. Now, by the way, the church that didn't hire me in 1996 the church that I really wanted to be a part of, you probably have heard of it. The church that didn't hire me as their youth minister in 1996 was Twin Falls Reformed Church. <laughs> God's timing is not the same as ours. Oh, by the way, so TFRC, when they did that youth search in 96, they had a, they had a committee, a search committee, and the chair of that committee is now the director of visitation here at TFRC. So it all worked out. It's all good. Um, God's timing is not the same as ours. God is present with us, even when his timing isn't the same. God is present to what is happening, and God knows what is happening. Going back to verse 10, where it says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. See, God isn't just the one who knows. It isn't that God simply knows everything, even though God does. God is the one who makes everything known. It's not that things happen, and then God learns about it. God knows of them because without him they do not happen. Which kind of leads to another question. If nothing happens without God being, you know, a part of that, well, why would God allow evil to happen? God knows of things because without them they do not happen. Well, this includes bad things. Now, not saying that God is the cause of evil, but why would God allow evil to happen? Now, in philosophy, there's actually a term for this question. The term for this question in philosophy is the problem of evil. And the problem of evil asks, how can a good, all-powerful God allow evil in the world? And there are two philosophical answers 
to the philosophical problem of evil? And those two answers are, a good God who is all-powerful can allow evil for two reasons. One, to prevent a greater evil. Two, to bring about a greater good. A good, all-powerful God allows bad things for those two reasons, to prevent something worse from happening or to bring about a greater good. Now, I am not God, so I cannot tell you how every evil thing that happens in the world prevents something worse from happening or brings about a greater good. I don't know how that all works out. I'm not God. I'm just giving you two reasons why a good, all-powerful God would allow evil that we experience. These two philosophical reasons are not meant to be comforting in the middle of suffering. <laughs> when we suffer, we need comfort, not philosophy. And so I am sorry for your suffering. And I pray that you experience God's comfort in the times when you suffer. But these reasons are just something to hold on to when your suffering makes you question God's activity in your life. And the epitome of our faith is the cross. Well, Jesus' suffering and dying on the cross, that wasn't a good thing. Yet, the cross prevented something worse and brought about something greater. The cross prevents our sins from counting against us. And the cross brought about the resurrection. When we suffer, it doesn't mean that God isn't active. God knows what's happening. And he is active in working all things out for our good. God is present to what is happening, and God knows what is happening. And God has the final say on what is happening. Going back to the passage one more time. Verse 11. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that... I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. This passage is in the context of God confronting the false gods the Israelites were worshiping. He is speaking against the idols who have no power. The idols, they're idle. They don't do anything. Unlike them, God is active in the world. He makes plans, and what he plans is what he does, which gives us hope because God isn't just active in our universe. He isn't just active in our world. He is active in our lives. As it says in Proverbs 16, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Or, as Pastor John Austin would often say, God is more active in your life than you would probably be comfortable with. God can bring a bird from the other side of the world to fulfill his plan. And God will call people from far away to fulfill his purpose. So let me just ask you, this is a, I'm going to ask you to raise hands and participate. It should be painless. How many of you moved to the Magic Valley, either as a teenager or adult? If you moved to the Magic Valley as a teenager or adult, keep, and keep your hands up, keep your hands up, hands up, hands up. Okay, now, if you move to the, you got to keep your hands up. Don't put your hands down yet. Okay, it hasn't been that long. All right, now, keep your hands up if you moved here from more than 500 miles away. Okay, keep your hands up if you moved here from more than 1,000 miles away. Okay, now, how many of you, you can put your hands down. Sorry, I scared you last time there. Don't you dare put your hands down, what's wrong with you? Okay, uh, now, 
Raise your hand if you were born and raised in the Magic Valley, okay? And keep them up. I'm not raising my hand because it's not true for me, okay? Now, keep them up if this is true for your parents. Keep them up if it's true for your grandparents. All right, you can put your hands down. God has a plan for this place. God has a plan for the community of TFRC. He has brought some of us here from hundreds or thousands of miles away. He has brought some of us here from across multiple generations. He has a plan for us and has brought us together for a purpose. So do not be discouraged when things don't go exactly how we thought they would go. What God has planned is what God will do. And the good news is that God is active and interested in your life. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe you're in a great stretch of life. Maybe you're suffering. Maybe you're just going through the motions. God is active and interested in your life because he wants to use us to accomplish his plan. Because what God plans, God does. The God that we read about in the Bible, the God who split the seas, made the sun stand still, walked on water, and healed the sick, that same God is active today. And the same God who was active back then is still active now, which is good for us because we need him. <laughs> we need him to be active in our lives. God is actively at work in us. Please pray with me. And Lord, we do <laughs> thank you for your activity in us and through us, both as individuals and families and as a community of faith. And Lord, I would ask that you would open our eyes and see how you are active in and through us. And Lord, that you would soften our hearts and that we would humbly submit to what you are calling us to do and be. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.